On a warm day in October of 1982, John DeLorean boarded a flight from New York to Los Angeles with one goal in mind, to make $24 million and save his beloved DeLorean Motor Company. The DeLorean car had hit the market a year before, and between the harsh critics and lack of sales, John was in trouble with a lot of investors. When the plane touched down, John's contact handed over 59 pounds of cocaine, still only a quarter of the amount he needed to complete his master plan. John DeLorean pumped himself up. He was ready to become a drug kingpin, all in the name of saving his company. He opened the door to a seedy hotel, but instead of the millions of dollars he expected on the other side, he found himself face to face with the guns and handcuffs of the FBI. The G-men demanded John DeLorean put up his hands and drop the giant bag of cocaine. The 1980s were wild and the supercars of that era were no exception. Automakers were operating by Mad Max rules. Anything goes and damn the consequences. Brainstorming sessions stopped just short of strapping rockets to the back of a Cadillac Brougham and aiming it at the moon. Supercar designers were wringing every horsepower out of every valve and relying on prayers to ensure that no one died in the process. Today on Past Gas, how did the race to breaking 200 miles per hour in a production car set the tone for a decade? How did cars like the gorgeous Lamborghini Countach, the Ferrari Testarossa, and the beastly Roof Yellowbird become potent symbols for an unhinged 10 years of excess? Pack the trunk with coke, blast some Guns N' Roses, throw in the Oakleys. I pity the fool who isn't ready for an all 80s, all supercar episode of Pass Gas. Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Y'all know it's coming. We've done Valvoline a lot of times. We love Valvoline. Valvoline is the original motor oil. They were patented over 150 years ago. Not only were they the first patented motor oil, they've also had many firsts in the industry. I'm talking the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. That's a lot of benchmarks. And since they first patented motor oil over 150 years ago, they have not stopped innovating. They are constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every single motor oil Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. It's proven to maximize engine life by finding the four main causes of engine breakdown. We're talking heat, friction, wear, and deposits. Maybe if the previous owner of my Forerunner would have used Valvoline, we wouldn't have so many deposits I would be driving my Forerunner instead of having the engine rebuilt. But alas, here we are. Another reason we love Valvoline, they're synonymous with some of the racing greats. We're talking Mark Martin, Kill Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and last year's NASCAR champ, Chase Elliott. So do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline next time you get oil. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine. And thank you, Valvoline. You know where you are? You in the jungle, baby. <laughs> you gonna die. Bah, bah, bah. You in the jungle. Welcome to the jungle. Knees, knees, knees. Knees. Ooh. I want to watch you bleed. Dude, freaking Zoom just popped up a little notification that was like, are you playing music? Uh, whoa. You want to set up professional audio in audio? What? Dang. No way. Oh, nah, dude. Zoom's good. listening in. They're saying, hey, we're going to listen to James every, every word. Zoom is like, dang, is Axl Rose a guest on past <laughs> yeah. guests this week? <laughs> Very impressive, James. Thanks, bro. I think that's one of those songs that I never have to hear again in my life and be Are okay. you kidding me? Nope. Welcome to the jungle? Yeah. I don't need to hear it ever again. Same with Hotel California. Hotel California is a dog sh song. Uh, don't Stop Believing. <laughs> Same with uh, We Are the Champions or Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, we Are the Champions is good. Okay. Anything that was featured on Glee, never need to hear it again. It got pounded into my... 2011 brain because for some reason everything that was on glee got played 50 more times at any high school event that sounds like a generational problem yeah i, well, I agree with i agree with the sentiment but i like those songs my song <laughs> yeah i only i only agree because i understand tone Loke's uh bust a move 
Oh. Anytime I hear that, I've been hearing that for f-ing 30 years on ads and everything. It's such a like white person, like lame <laughs> ad song that it's like, come on, like just f- it's like, stop playing this song. You know what song I never need to hear again? What? Yeah, by Usher and Little John. No, that's I like a that song. No, I, that played at like every junior high dance. Yeah, uh, it's like I, the attended. wedding song. Like, yeah, yeah. Or like sure. anytime <laughs> when I work. <laughs> I like the song. I like the song because in the beginning, Usher says, "Peace up, a town down." And you know me, being from Atascadero, California, <laughs> we called eight. Uh, you know, we called it a town. So it uh-huh. felt like Usher was talking to me with that song. Like he that was, song he was, was talking about us. Atlanta, Georgia. I know, but it felt like Atascadero. I, I like that song because that was like one of the first mashups I ever made. I I mixed the vocals from Yeah with the music from Sunday Bloody Sunday, which is probably uh, disgraceful, but it turned out really good. I would like to hear that mashup. I hate you too. I wish that you two would get in a plane crash and die. You two was like no. my favorite band. <laughs> U2 was one of my first favorite bands. I could uh, see that. Up. I mean, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. And guess what? I went back and listened to one of their greatest hits album. Yeah. Yeah. They Is got some bangers, slap? dude. They, they got do. some bangers, dude. They do dude. slap. U2 uh, does slap. I don't like them. Like, they seem annoying on a personal level, but they got some bangers. Like, New Year's Day has that incredible, yeah. like, uh, intro with, you know, the edge, dude. He's, he uses effects, James. <laughs> you know what I'm kind of learning from this conversation is we're all sick of songs because of, you know, they got overplayed in our lives, yeah. like at bar mitzvahs and middle school dances. Uh-huh. But all of those songs got played a lot for a reason because they're bangers. Yeah. Just like I hope today's episode is a banger. Welcome to Past Gas. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes. Joined as always by my co-host, we got Joe Weber over there. What is what's my phrase again? Keep it true. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it, dude. That's a sick producer tech. What's my phrase again? <laughs> <laughs> like just totally just apathetic. What's my phrase to again? <laughs> what's my phrase again? <laughs> apathetic to their job. Like wait a minute, what what am I doing here? What's my, what's phrase, my again? phrase again? And what's then just like the sickest beat you've ever heard. Well, I, yeah. I I have like trained my brain to wait for. James to say something really dumb before. <laughs> what? Well, that's why. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what, dude? Excuse me. So I got caught off guard. Oh, dang, dang, dude. Pardon me. Our other co-host. We got we got James Pumphrey in the building. Me, me, me. Ooh, I want to watch you bleed. Uh, yeah, welcome to Past Gas, the the world's number one uh, middle school dance music podcast. Speaking of um, eighty, like eighties disappointing guys, like can you me- like I think the world would be a much better place if Axl Rose didn't become like a huge disappointment. Do you think he would have changed the world for the better if he was uh, would have stuck to music and put out Chinese Democracy <laughs> earlier? <laughs> yeah, I don't think he would have changed the world, but. I think my life would have improved <laughs> just overall. Yeah. Just like, uh, just like constantly, like my whole like adolescence and then early adult life was like in the back of my head. It was like, man, that guy really, it really sucks, huh? <laughs> it really, everything is connected. Well, now you're stuck here with us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think on that note, let's talk about some supercars for sure. Super. Wait, let's, let's, Throw out our favorite 80s supercars real quick. Oh, that's a good idea, Joe. Okay. Go ahead. You first. Well, I didn't think of, I, it's, <laughs> I, I got to think about <laughs> all right, all right, Okay. All right. First, first thing that pops into my head is the yellow bird. Just okay. cool. It It's beautiful. I'd say if I had to drive one every day, yellow bird would be it. It's not a bad like choice for sure. I, uh, I DM'd roof two days ago. Yeah. What'd Any they response? Say? Yeah, and I was like, y'all got any long-term loaners? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the the Diablo came out in 89, right? Ooh. Uh, yeah. That sounds I'd about go, right. I'd have to go with that. I think that's a 90s. That t- I think that counts as 90s. I think I think you're right, but it also came out in eighty nine. Yeah. So that yeah. <laughs> so uh, few. Um, so like But you would you would daily that even though people have talked oh, about Oh no, I would probably okay. not no. No, no, no. I've heard that it's not very comfortable to daily. That's why. 
Uh, yeah, I oh, think. I'm sorry, it came out in 1990. My bad. Never mind. I, it's not even right. I don't like. I'm not really a huge fan of the Countach, to be honest. Well, you don't have to. You can pick a, another car too. Yeah. <laughs> ah, supercar, supercar, 80s. 80s. What about that, be... like a Testarossa or something? Testarossa is my pick. Yeah, Testarossa is pretty sick. Be honest, guys. I don't really know a lot about these 80s supercars because you're so. F- Young, we get it. Uh, yep, it's a little uh, before my time, the eighties. So, <laughs> is he saying skin a knee? Skin a knees, knees, knees. Ooh, this one really stings. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we uh, <laughs> got that clarified. Let's let's get into the show today. All right. So we've already covered why the 1990s were the ultimate decade for supercars, from the McLaren F1 to the Diablo, which I already mentioned, and the Bugatti EB110, as well as the weird Vector W8. They dominated every metric possible, and they did it without anti-lock braking systems or nanny tech ruining all the fun and keeping you alive. <laughs> but... How did we get to the pinnacle of peak performance? It all started with cocaine. Buckets and buckets of the stuff. But the cocaine symbolized something. A spirit of excess and exuberance in the automotive world, as manufacturers and consumers alike rocketed their way out of the great malaise era of driving. By the 1980s, supercars led the charge on the quest to make production cars fun again. Like the moment leading to all technological advancements, the 80s started with a distinct challenge in mind, to break the 200 mile per hour barrier in a production car. The race to 200 was vicious. Feelings and people got hurt. Technology got pushed to the breaking point, and then it was broke. (laughs) This wasn't speed trials on some salt flat in some weird looking spaceship, no. The goal was that for the first time in history, people would be able to buy a car capable of hitting 200 miles per hour that they could also drive to buy groceries with the AC cranked up. And for that amazing privilege, they were willing to pay a lot of cash. I just, just reading it now, because I know this story, I've heard it a million times, but just reading it is insane to me. Like, why would you ever need to hit 200 miles per hour? Because it's, cool. it's there. It's super cool. Because it's there. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's a good goal. But where would you ever be able to hit 200 miles per hour unless you're going to, like, Las Vegas? I don't know. It's it's cool. It's cool. I'll leave it at that. It's all about having something that's capable of doing something even if you never do it. Anyway. The race to 200 started with a man named Nicola Matarazzi and a little company called Ferrari. I was just thinking about 200 miles an hour. What's the um, fastest you've ever driven? Uh, one, 136. Yeah, I hit 117 in my dad's Eclipse. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that sounds like a high school drug dealer bragging. <laughs> uh, funny you say that. <laughs> the first time the 200 mile per hour land speed record was broken was on March 29th, just nine days after Nolan's birthday, 1927. <laughs> a full 60 years before the Ferrari F40 was put into production. The car, driven by Sir Henry Seagrave, was an absolute beast and definitely was not intended to be driven in any sort of real-life environment. The dude's a knight. The car, nicknamed the Slug, (laughs) was built by Sunbeam Car Company in Wolverhampton, UK, and was powered by a 22.5-liter V12 aircraft engine that put out just over 1,000 horsepower. The car was trailered to Daytona Beach, where by some miracle it managed to not take flight and wound up hitting 203 miles per hour. That's terrifying. On On sand? On sand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That dude deserves to be a knight, for sure. Yeah. Seagrave, more like sand grave. (laughs) Yeah, it's like now everybody's like a knight, like Patrick Stewart. It's like, Patrick Stewart, like, you only pretended to be a captain, you know? (laughs) (laughs) 
But the fellas over at, I, yeah, acting's hard. He's good at it. But the fellas over at Ferrari were a little more refined. Materazzi had an idea that would revolutionize motorsports and daily drivers. He took a long, hard look at Group B, commonly known as the golden era of rally racing, and decided that Scuderia Guy Fieri would use those ideals <laughs> to build a car so bonkers that it would change history. Materazzi went to the higher ups at Ferrari and was told, a no away. But <laughs> it wasn't a real a no away. It was more a uh, go ask a young mother uh, kind of no away. <laughs> I committed to that and I'm really regretting it. <laughs> because at the end of the day, he was given permission to develop the GTO Evolucione, which means evolution in Italian, if you didn't know. But only. <laughs> I figured. I figured. But only if they did all of their work outside of regular business hours, a real skunk works project. The next year, Group B was suddenly shut down because the cars were too fast and it cost too many people their lives, both drivers and spectators. Back at Ferrari, the death of Group B left five 288 GTO Evolucione sitting in the company's garage with no real purpose. Enzo Ferrari convinced Materazzi <laughs> that they could keep the base concept of their car and make the whole thing roadworthy. Enzo Ferrari was getting old and he wanted to leave a legacy behind other than decades of best <laughs> Ferrari designs and a million billion race wins. So the Ferrari F40 concept was born. Materazzi and Ferrari tapped Leonardo Fiotavanti and Pietro Camardella of Pininfarina to design the... <laughs> oh, that is... I think, that, like, come on, guys. Like, that's like an, like, who am I? Logic? <laughs> <laughs> who can relate? <laughs> <laughs> Materazzi and Ferrari tap Leonardo Fittinor avanti. Piazza Camarada. <laughs> it sounds like a racehorse announcer. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, from Pininfarina to design the overall look, feel, and function of the car. Pininfarina were the people who handled the design of cars ranging from the spectacular Ferrari 375 mm to the f40 successor the f50 we've talked about pininfarina as much as any other company uh yeah. ever on you know across all donuts they stuff. pop like, up a lot they are the shit. the design house yeah materazzi and enzo ferrari had no doubt in their abilities in just under a year the team took the group b cars and made them into the scorching hot production f40 and then churned out 400 of them Oh, yeah. In 1988, Ferrari invited a group of journalists to the Ferrari test track and reviews were mixed. Gordon Murray called the car exciting but added, Whereas the other cars feel taut and solid, this one's like a big go kart with a plastic body on it. <laughs> God, it got real sexual. <laughs> Car and driver called the car a mix of sheer terror and raw excitement, which sounds exactly like a big go kart with a plastic body on it. Is this go Gordon Murray? That's not T Gordon Murray, is it? Uh, like T as in the Gordon Murray? No, T is like the guy who helped develop the F1, the McLaren F1. I'm looking that up right now because that caught my attention. Uh, let's see. No, that was Gordon. That was the Gordon Murray. That's him. Uh, yeah. That that was him saying cool. that about that car. Hell yeah. I didn't realize he was a journalist at some point. I think he just did it for, I don't think he was. I think he was just like doing a guest kind of yeah, okay. analysis for sense. Motor Trend. He also said a lot of nice things about the car. But Ferrari didn't care what anyone else thought. They never do. Their marketing department put out a statement saying, the F40 is for the most enthusiastic of our owners who want nothing but sheer performance. And that's what they got. Kind of. Ferrari themselves claimed to break 200 miles per hour in the F40, but no magazine or racing organization was ever able to recreate that magical 201 mile per hour claim that the F40 was putting down. In March of 1987, Roden Track threw a little party at the Volkswagen Era Lessen test track near Wolfsburg. Uh, they were, this is a really famous like race day. This is why the yellow bird is yellow. Um, mm -hmm. They were there to find out what current production car was the fastest. Paul Frera and Phil Hill, two champions of motorsports, handled the white knuckle driving. At the end of the day, one little car stole the spotlight away from Ferrari, and its name was the Roof 
yellow bird. <gasps> tweet, tweet. <laughs> Tweet, tweet. Ah, <laughs> uh, I thought I thought I put it in. <laughs> click, click, pow. Uh, before we get into the the yellow bird, I think the F forty is my favorite eighty supercar. It's uh, a good one. It's it's kind of a cliched pick, I would say, but you know I've got to see a couple of them in person, and yeah. they're just so cool. They're just they're amazing. so special. They're not too like they're not too ridiculous looking. You can tell that it just like means business you know yeah like knowing yeah. that it was developed you know initially for group b and then like modified into a street car from that you get makes it. a lot of sense yeah, yeah you're like oh sense. okay yeah uh-huh <laughs> during the 1987 road and track proving party the roof yellowbird absolutely dominated the scene a gaggle of automotive journalists were testing more than a dozen supercars and only two of them broke through the 200 mile per hour barrier and neither were the F40. First, the Koenig RS Turbo Porsche hit 201 miles per hour before a snapped fan belt sent it limping back to the garage. Never heard of that car. But then, the Roof Automotive Group, spelled R-U-F, headed by Alois Roof Sr., smoked the millions of dollars worth of Italian steel and leather present in the lineup of competitors. On that fateful day, the little 3.4 liter twin turbo flat six utilized all 470 of its ponies to reach a not safe for journalism top speed of 211 miles per hour. We got to drive uh, 450 horsepower 911. Yeah, the 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 Gunther Works uh, yeah. 911. And that was all naturally aspirated as well. Oh, it was so fun. Great car very nerve-wracking <laughs> yeah i was like i this is worth more than i can ever make in my lifetime i'm <laughs> i'm just gonna stay to the speed limit i uh set the rear end out on a pagani Wyra. jeez oh yeah that scares me and i just saw generations of my family going into debt <laughs> <laughs> the and insurance like, would have covered it <laughs> yeah and horacio pagani just like wagging his finger at you in your head <laughs> The Yellowbird was the definition of production car record breaker. It was an old school air cooled 911 stripped down to a minimal 2,579 pounds. Whoa. Which gives it a better power to weight ratio than a modern 911 Turbo S. With the turbos turned down, the car drives just like any other Carrera, but maybe a bit more nimble and stiff. But once those spinny boys spooled up, the Yellowbird went from Big Bird to Bird of Prey. Roof Sr. was dreaming of building a vehicle that hit prototype racer level performance in a daily driver package. And he did it. Today, the Yellowbird spec match up with a well specced Camaro SS. Both push around 470 horsepower and hit 0 to 60 in around four seconds. But the Camaro weighs in around a half ton chunkier. Of course, with a modern Camaro, you'd get navigation and heated seats, usable AC, and all sorts of other life amenities. But it just goes to show how far ahead of the time the yellow bird was. Why is it so much more impressive to say half ton than a thousand pounds? Because a ton is, I don't know. I've, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've noticed that as well. It's kind of, kind of weird. It's like, I drank a half a six pack last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, as cool as these cars were, the 80s wasn't all about cracking 200 miles per hour. It was also about aesthetics. Ooh. It may seem a little brash and tacky nowadays, but the 80s aesthetic was all about the future. Lasers, bright colors, big hair, and puffy shoulder pads. It was all about the individual. It was all about peacocking your way into the boardroom to do a little business transaction before peacocking your way to the beach to play some oiled up volleyball with the boys. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I was born in the wrong time. Sounds great. <laughs> Say what you want about the 1980s, but it wasn't boring. The in-your-face color schemes and angles upon angles of hot pink shapes has led to some interesting car designs. Speaking of in-your-face color schemes, uh, the reason that the roof yellow bird was yellow is because in Germany during that season, like they knew it was going to be a cloudy day. Like it was like June gloom. Um, and they needed a car that would like, they were going to paint it black, but they were like, the journalists are going to be there. This was like a big like, yeah. like magazine day. They're going to take pictures of it, and we really want to make a name and like really stand out. And they were like, well, 
what about red? They were like, well, all the Ferraris are going to be red. Yeah. And so they were like, what about yellow? And they were like, <laughs> I don't know. And we actually talked to Alois Roof on the phone. Yeah. And he, he that told was a us really that, cool. Yeah. He told us this story. He was like, yeah, man, back then cars weren't yellow. The only cars <laughs> that were yellow were cabs. Yeah. So like they basically painted the 911, the color of a taxi cab. <laughs> uh so that they would stand out in pictures That's uh, awesome. again, uh, and against the Ferraris. I always thought that it was at like um, the Nardo ring that they tested these, but that was a different <laughs> no, track day. So Volkswagen, oddly enough, has like the fastest track. That's the where world. they do the Bugatti testing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So like Volkswagen, I don't know why, um, probably Nazi reasons has like the longest straight in the world. So all of the top speed production car stuff happens at that uh, Volkswagen trip. Hmm. Uh, we we got to see a, a, a yellow bird or we shot one for bumper to bumper back in the day. Yeah. Uh, but it was really cool to go. We got to go to Bruce Myers collection over there in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Very nondescript location. Oh my God. It was um, so cool. And just got to get so up close with it. Very just so cool Did it wasn't even like being featured it was just on a loading dock like in yeah. the basement because of that video we have a standing invitation from roof uh they dm'd me and they were like thanks for shooting with the car you're welcome to visit our headquarters in faffenhausen anytime faffenhausen yeah so the next time next time we're in faffenhausen yeah yeah we're coming we're coming roof. roof just don't go to faffenhausen i know don't I accidentally <laughs> went to faffenhausen <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where a dash cam would have come in handy? Someone been driving sketchy in front of you and then all of a sudden, BAM! You're in an accident? Before it's too late, get the day and night protection your vehicle deserves with the Blackview DR750X Plus Series Cloud Dash Cams. Whether you're driving on a busy road or parked for the night, Blackview Dash Cams have you covered. The Blackview DR750X Plus model features an upgraded Sony StarViz sensor, giving you stunning clarity and vivid colors even in the most challenging of situations. This thing is amazing. The extended dynamic range means that your Blackview dash cam will capture even more detail in highlights and the shadows. The shadows. You want something with high dynamic range because that means uh, you can have a lot of detail in contrasting situations. If there's a lot of darkness and brightness in one shot, more dynamic range means more detail in those situations. That means no more blowing out license plates with your headlights at night. How convenient is that? That's exactly what you want with a dash cam. And during the day, colors and details are preserved throughout the whole frame. The front camera records full HD 1080p at 60 frames per second, letting you capture critical moments even at high speed. The Blackview DR750X Plus features a built-in voltage monitor, letting you hardwire your Blackview for ultimate protection when you're away without draining your vehicle's battery. That's awesome. With Blackview Cloud, you can rest easy knowing that you can check in on your car at any time and even receive notifications on your phone. I think dash cams are a must have these days. It makes it so easy to document any sort of accident on the road or any sort of thing that you can hand off to your insurance company or law enforcement. It helps you rest easier at night knowing that you're covered. And the fact that you can look at stuff in the cloud is also very, very cool. Blackview DR750X Plus Series. Dash cams you can rely on. Go to blackview.com slash gas and use promo code gas to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam. That's blackvue.com slash gas. Free shipping for orders over $200. Thank you very much, Blackview, for sponsoring this episode. Big thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Sometimes when it comes to paying off debt, it can feel like an uphill battle. I can speak from experience on that one. I was in debt for a long time. High interest rates resulting in minimum monthly payments keeps you in an endless cycle of debt. Upstart can actually help you get ahead. Are you carrying a credit card balance month after month after month? Well, you're not the only one. High interest rates make it really hard to pay off your debt. Join the thousands of happy borrowers who made that final payment and got debt free. Upstart is a fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at more than just your credit score, like your income and your employment history. They look at the whole story, not just like one little aspect. 
Because of this, this means they can offer smarter rates with trusted partners. With a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Upstart is super easy to use. I can speak from experience. I, I applied for a loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash gas. That's upstart.com slash GAS. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash gas. Thank you, Upstart. When you think of 80s supercar design, more likely than not, the Lamborghini Countach is the car you see in your mind's eye. Of course. <laughs> Everything about it screamed the 1980s. First of all, it was just a total doorstop wedge of a car. When you drew car shapes as a kid, this is what came out. No, the I drew a Mercury Grand Marquis because that's what my mom had. <laughs> it's easy to draw. <laughs> nice. The angled, yeah, you either do the three box design or you do the wedge. Yeah. The angled wedge of a supercar designed by the world-renowned Gruppo Bertone also had insane vertical open doors and the look of a Tom Cruise piloted fighter jet. Speaking of beach volleyball. Every pimply teenager wanted a Countach. Yeah. An entire industry popped up to sell posters of a beautiful woman leaning against the same Rosso Siviglia Rot or bright red colored Countach. The earliest Countaches pushed 375 horsepower while the final version of the naturally aspirated V12 just passed the 450 horsepower mark and weighed 3,000 pounds, a whole 500 pounds beefier than the Yellowbird. While this pushed the supercar to a 4.7 second 0 to 60, the Italian Stallion wasn't all about performance. And compared to the Yellowbird, it felt like a Bentley inside. Ooh. The interior at first at glance comes off like something you'd see in a Fiero. It's all boxy right angles. But upon closer inspection, it's easy to see the care and quality that went into the construction. The interiors are not molded GM plastic swoops. They're hand-stitched artisanal displays of craftsmanship, which is insane considering how chunky everything looks. While the interior of a Porsche 959 looks like an homage to a Roadster from the 60s, the Countach interior looks wholly unique and different, and it fits. The uh, So I don't know about back then, I assume it's the same, but now Lamborghini only gets their leather from this one like ranch elmo yeah i think so yeah uh and they don't use barbed wire yeah because it's it mars it'll, the yeah it'll hide. scar the cow's skin and that'll translate to the leather how often do cows really run into fences though turns Why out did you a say lot that like like fred durst <laughs> <laughs> Why they always running into fences <laughs> At the Lamborghini factory, which is like surprisingly small, there's like two little ladies, like little Italian ladies, looking at all the leather. Whoa. To make sure there's no uh, imperfections in it. I'm, well, I'm not sure if uh, Lamborghini does this, but do they have like one of those stations where they'll mark if there's any imperfections and then like a, a laser will scan it and then cut oh. the, the pieces like perfectly, but also avoiding those areas it's the same situation as that but instead of a laser it's two old ladies and if something is marred they'll circle it with chalk like a grease yeah paint. exactly and then the laser avoids that area when cutting no they oh. cut everything by hand still that seems yeah. like it takes so much longer that's why they're so expensive <laughs> they actually put a limit on how many cars they'll make a day oh that's cool and that's what the countach and lamborghini is all about the Countach could get smoked by a Corvette, but that doesn't matter. It's a car that is quick, but feels faster. At 35, you feel like you're cruising at 60. When you're standing still, you feel like you're on top of the world. It's a nod and a wink that says, hey, <laughs> I'm rich and hilarious, and people <laughs> will never tire of finding new ways to shout that message from their luxurious rooftops. Just ask Russell Brand. Does he have a Countach? No, I don't know. He's just rich and hilarious. <laughs> you think Sometimes. he's hilarious? I think he's funny in Saving, uh, what is it, Sarah Silverman? Yeah, Saving Sarah Silverman. <laughs> saving Sarah Silverman. No, what is it? Uh, getting over Sher Sarah Marshall. <laughs> forgetting Sarah Marshall. Forgetting <laughs> yeah. Sarah Silverman. Of course, we can't forget about Lamborghini's perennial sparring partner, Ferrari. 
While Ferrari was working after hours to build the F40, during a school day, Enzo and the team were cranking out their newest moneymaker, the Testarossa. While the F40 pushed as fast as possible to break 200 miles per hour and freak out automotive journalists, the Testarossa was built to be the car favored by drug dealers and Wall Street dudes. <laughs> it cost half of what the F40 cost and had 100 less horsepower, but it was slick as hell. Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Looks like a tiger tried to get it, but it couldn't because oh, the Testarossa is too oh, yeah. strong. Got those big old intakes on the side. Oh, it is yeah, also yeah. the car from OutRun. And Cruising USA? Uh, nothing in Cruising USA was licensed, but... I think warm. they... Yeah, they modeled it after that. Before the third season of Miami Vice launched, Ferrari had been launching some lawsuits at replica builders. And the mechanics at Miami Vice were supremely guilty because they had a couple of old C3 Corvettes dressed up as Daytona Spiders. <laughs> The, the lawyers for the show wanted zero trouble, and Ferrari were looking to cut a deal because of the show's popularity. So in exchange for blowing up the fake spiders, uh, which they literally they shot them with missiles on the show, Ferrari handed over a pristine 1986 white Ooh. Testarossa. Look, are you going to blow up the cars and then the, the two detectives, they're going to go and uh, pee on the fire the and they're going to say, <laughs> oh, I hated these cars. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> the, the Testarossa arrived at just the right time in the 1980s, so much so that every single one made was sold. There was even a five-year waiting list for the sexy supercar. At the time, its specs were respectable, but today they barely cracked BMW's entry-level M2, somewhat entry-level, I guess. In fact, the M2 will hit 0-60 to 60 a second faster than the Testarossa for a whole lot less money, but I will say that Testarossa will look a lot cooler doing it. Even though the M2 is very, very, it's a cool car, cool car. Yeah, I don't think I don't think those should be compared. The Testarossa was cemented as an absolute icon of the big hair era, and Miami Vice went on to inspire everything from Grand Theft Auto Vice City to pretty much every cop show that followed in its powerboat-driven wake. The, I've never actually seen Miami Vice. The pilot to Miami Vice is one of the best things ever made. Really? It's so good. Michael Mann produced it. Oh. It's Ooh. just like so sick. And like it and like the fact that it was on TV in like the yeah. 80s, like like now big budget TV is sort of having a heyday right now with like Game of Thrones and like the Lord yeah. of the Rings stuff and Mayor of East Town. Mick, yeah. Yeah. But in Miami Vice, uh, it's just, it's so good. And there's like this moment where like they're driving in the Ferrari and they got like mm -hmm. a shotgun. And then like the dude, like, what's his name? Uh, Don Johnson. He's like, yeah. he's like, pull over. And he like goes to a pay phone and he's just like, we don't know what he's doing. And the, like this woman just answers the phone. He's like, hey, what we had, it was special, right? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. And he's like, tight click and then he's just like going to a gunfight it's so cool <laughs> like just weird like 80s violence it was cool yeah and like uh tough guy sentimentality yeah 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 hey, we had it was special right <laughs> he's like yeah cool i can die now <laughs> While the Testarossa was inspiring movie stars and rich guys, the Porsche 959 was inspiring people who wanted to take driving fast to the next level. The 959 was the antithesis to everything the Testarossa stood for. But this wasn't the jacked up, roided out roof yellow bird that was built as an F40 killer. This was a refined rocket that you could drive to dinner and let the valet park, though. Don't ever let the valet park your 959. Remember Ferris Bueller? Rest in peace to that <laughs> fake Ferrari 250 GT California. It was fake? Yeah. Good. When it came down to what was under the deck lid, the 959 was a masterpiece of futuristic technology that took the rest of the world two decades to catch up to. It featured fully adjustable suspension stiffness and ride height from the cabin and the first ever PSK all-wheel drive system and a super advanced water-cooled motor, which wouldn't be seen on another Porsche until 1997. This We shot one for Bumper to Bumper like two years ago, and this was like one of the most striking cars I've ever been up close with. 
Mm -hmm. It's just so like cool, and the angles were perfect. And yeah, the interior the cabin was so was, sick. Yeah, yeah, it was like what a dream my, car. like one of my favorite features was the the interior. Uh, yeah, they yeah. had some really interesting material choices and stitching and patterns for the seats, which I always thought were yeah, really weren't cool. they like they gray cloth? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And like alternating patterns. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Porsche interiors from the 80s are sick. Oh, no, wait. No, this this car had the three-tone leather. The back of the seat was like silver leather that was three-tone. Oh, yeah. Silver leather it is was, a move. Yeah, it's very yeah. cool. Let me get some silver leather pants. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> what if next next shoot day I show up like we're getting COVID tests and I just like show up with like silver leather pants and a zero t shirt as you like, walk up, <laughs> yeah, like a zero shirt. Like, uh, what's his name? Billy, Billy Corgan. Corgan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the truly shocking thing about the nine five nine wasn't its blistering zero to sixty times or its comfy bolstered silver leather seats. It was that this little monster was designed to do 200 miles per hour off-road. I love that. It was also built uh, as part of the Group B rule set that inspired a lot on this list, as well as a lot of death and destruction, which is why, again, Group B is banned. Another shocking factoid about the 959 is that it sold for around 225000 1980s dollars, which is about $730,000 in today's money. But it cost the German company more than 500,000 1980s bucks to get each car off the assembly line, making it one of the most effective loss leaders in car history. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. While Porsche was breaking records by dumping money into a black hole while following Group B rules, Americans were doing what Americans do starting with a Chevy V8 and building from there. The legendary Corvette builder and horsepower tweaker extraordinaire Reeves Calloway was looking for a challenge in the late 1980s, and that challenge was the sledgehammer. Sledgehammer. Like all custom car builders, he wanted to set a record of his own, as he's always done up to this point, starting with Chevy's fiberglass sports car, the Corvette. Specifically, the nicely wedge-shaped C4 with specs that would compete fiercely with a 2020 Honda Accord. <laughs> Cars are good nowadays, guys. I don't think we we take it for granted. Cars yeah, are like great. really good. Callaway had a vision for the two-door sports car. He wanted insane, streetable, and reliable power by building up a turbocharged Chevy V8. And he wanted the car to remain comfy along the way. He got to work and tapped another legend, Tall Deutschman, to handle the bodywork. <laughs> Did you say Tall? <laughs> Oh, his name is Paul. Paul? Yeah. Uh, okay. Tall, Tall Deutschman. Tall Deutschman would be like, his name is Tall German Guy. Yeah. He's Tall German Guy. His name is Paul Deutschman. Paul Deutschman was going to handle the body work because Callaway knew he needed aesthetics with aerodynamics that would allow the little Corvette to slip its way through the atmosphere and break its own 200 mile per hour record. Deutschman and his team handcrafted the aero body, which kept the car looking distinctly C4 while adding a bunch of speed holes all over. It does like, it looks cool. It I really They're appreciate sick. that they picked light purple as a mm -hmm. color for this because it is just, it looks so unique, even for the 80s. Yeah, it's so all, good. Those, all those Callaway cars were cool colors. There's yeah. like a cool like te teal. Under the hood, Callaway did what he did best. He boosted, tweaked, and honed the Chevy V8 into making big horsepower. 898 ponies and 772 foot-pounds of torque blasting out of the twin-turbocharged V8, running 22 pounds of boost in Whoa. a V8. Good God. <laughs> That's more than double the power of the blistering Porsche 959 and F40, and more than 200 than the McLaren F1 that wasn't even a sketch in a notebook yet. Good Lord. A lot of power. It's also an OZ Mitos, which is really cool. The wheels. Very popular wheel in the Volkswagen community. I bet every it feels like every Corvette wheel is a popular wheel in the in the in the Volkswagen community. <laughs> burn. Oh, a scorch and burn. The appeal of European snooty horsepowers over the blistering horses of Americans was that the interior was still refined and livable. The Countach and Testarossa were handcrafted leather ecodomes of luxury. 
while their American counterparts, let's say a 1971 Chevelle 454 SS, stuck you on a pleather bench seat grabbing a steel and plastic shifter. Well, that was not so with the Callaway Sledgehammer. Its impressive numbers were backed up by a full, cushy leather interior, power windows and locks, a booming Bose audio system, frigid electronic air conditioning. Ooh, so cold. Power sports seats and a tucked away roll cage to keep your bits all in one piece if you hit a guardrail. The sledgehammer was everything American muscle wanted to be with the performance Euro manufacturers were dreaming of making. Callaway also put his reputation on the line. He talked NHRA demigod John Lingenfelter into driving the sledgehammer on a 1,400-mile round trip from the Callaway shop in Connecticut to Ohio and back. They made a quick stop at the Transportation Research Center Proving Grounds in East Liberty, Ohio, a 4,500-acre site where cars are pushed to their breaking point, literally. Uh, they crash test cars and find their top speeds. When the sledgehammer was dropped, Lingenfelter pushed the turbo vet to a brain-melting 254.76 <laughs> miles per hour. Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. Easily a record, and one that stood for more than a decade. It wasn't considered a production car, so the Yellowbird still held on tight with its 213 mile per hour run. But Callaway's trophy listed the Sledgehammer as the world's fastest street legal car, which was a record he was happy to crush. That is insane. I had no idea it went that fast. That's yeah. so fast. That's worthy of the name for sure. That's crazy. That's like over 100 miles an hour faster than either of you nerds have driven. <laughs> What's the fastest you've gone, James? 168. In a in what? A track hawk? I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> it's a track <laughs> hawk, isn't it? <laughs> but sadly, not all 1980s cars were smashing records and climbing to Valhalla on the back of cocaine-fueled executives blowing money like the world was ending. Woo! Supercars were super because they had massive budgets. The 959 was awesome because Porsche was losing more than $200,000 on each car. The Countach was made without cutting a single corner. In fact, they added corners. <laughs> and, the, and the Testarossa was designed with a pure aesthetic in mind. But the rest of us had to deal with the realities of the 1970s oil crisis hangover and the bevy of emissions equipment foisted upon us by a government that thought they were doing the right thing, which, you know, they were. They were. Have you seen, like, look at pictures of L.A. in the 70s. Yeah. It's disgusting. Man, things were so much better back then with things brown were, air. <laughs> yeah, we like brown air. Every time we start an old car at donut like it's like <laughs> oh yeah this is why catalytic converters are good <laughs> there's a guy on my street who has a really sick old monte carlo and he'll mm -hmm. drive it like you know when he's driving by my house like the air just changes you know like, you can feel your body chemistry changing when it goes by it's yeah. like oh that's a uh, messing my dna up yeah <laughs> yeah like let and it and the it that, that stuff used to have lead in it yeah, <laughs> that's why the, that's why there's so there were so many serial killers in the 70s. And, and that's why like every baby boomer has like insane temper issues. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. What interferes with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? Things are starting to get back to normal, but that doesn't mean that you can't be in a rough spot. Well, luckily, BetterHelp is here for you. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. BetterHelp allows you to connect in a safe and private online environment. It's super convenient, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. You can send a message to your counselor at any time with BetterHelp, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room with old magazines and a TV set to DIY network. Nothing against DIY network, but they don't have property brothers. And I like property brothers. 
BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That's just part of the process. Nothing wrong with that. And that's why it's awesome. They make it easy. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide and you can find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to counselors located in your immediate area. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. Anything you share with your counselor on BetterHelp is confidential. It's super convenient, professional, and affordable. You can also check out testimonials posted daily on their site. And remember guys, BetterHelp is not a crisis line. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I love how easy BetterHelp makes it to take control of your mental health. And I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash past gas. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash past gas. Thank you very much, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this episode. Hey, big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Did you know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? They were the first to patent motor oil over 150 years ago, and since then they have not stopped innovating. Valvoline has also had many firsts in the oil industry. We're talking the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. And they've never stopped innovating. Valvoline is constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. And they do that by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown. We're talking heat, friction, wear, and deposit. Deposits. I use Valvoline in my car just because I know I can trust it and my engine's gonna love it. And another reason we love Valvoline over here at Donut is they're synonymous with some of the racing greats. AJ Foyt, Cale Yarborough, Mark Martin, and last year's NASCAR champ, Chase Elliott. So do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline. Head over to valvoline.com original to find the right oil for your engine. And thank you, Valvoline. In the early 80s, prototypes of the DeLorean were catching car enthusiasts' eyes and making them salivate over the idea of gold wing doors for under $80,000. Fanboys wanted them badly and couldn't wait for the cars to be shipped over from the plant in Northern Ireland where the UK government was subsidizing the manufacturing of the cars. Demand was so high that John DeLorean thought he was on easy street and he went and got a bunch of chin implants and dated models <laughs> slash actresses. <laughs> they started pumping out DeLoreans, but they were plagued by production delays and problems at the factory. They finally got automotive journalists behind the wheel, and that's when it all really started to fall apart. In a 1981 issue of Road and Track, acclaimed automotive journalist John Lamb spent pages waxing poetic about the styling of the car, the smell of the interior leather, the placement of the pedals, on and on. But what Lamb spent pages avoiding was the sluggish performance of the admittingly bad looking car. After 1,200 words about the new car smell and gold wing doors, he finally admits, the DeLorean is not a bond boner. <laughs> hey, kid, you want an onion? <laughs> and, and he's understating that a lot. The DeLorean was powered by a Renault V6 that coughed out a pathetic 130 horsepower. That's the same as a Honda Fit. And the silver car came in more than 1,000 pounds heavier than said fit. Yeah. The RPV engine is not a great engine. It's it was not, not a good his engine. first choice. <laughs> no, no, uh, it was like his fifth choice. <laughs> yeah. A modern Chevy Camaro weighs in at around the same 3,500 pounds as the DeLorean, but is stacked with more than 300 horsepower, even in the V6 form, and can do 0 to 60 in 5.5 seconds. The DeLorean takes more than 10 seconds to get to 60 and tops out at 110. These are compact econo car numbers at best, but there were going doors. Can you imagine if a DeLorean, like an electric DeLorean came out nowadays and they had all the extra safety equipment and still like the stainless steel body, it would be, it would weigh as much as a Hummer EV. It'd be like 9,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it would, you'd have to like, you could get a, um, Probably like a tax credit because it was so heavy. <laughs> yeah, it was like a, a medium-duty vehicle. Yeah. You know? 
Another huge problem was build quality. The Brits had invested millions setting John DeLorean up with a swanky Northern Ireland factory, and then sales fell off the cliff as soon as people started driving the cars. DeLoreans were sitting unsold, and the UK decided that they were done financing the pipe dream. DMC had failed to recoup $175 million in investment costs. Unsold cars wound up double parked all over Ireland, and the company was dead in the water. So, in October of 1982, when the DeLorean's friend James Timothy Hoffman called and suggested that they sell a whopping $24 million worth of cocaine, or 220 pounds, <laughs> like, that's a me of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worth $24 million. I don't know. Let's check your celebrity net worth. It was pretty spot on last time at $13 million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it was the 80s, DeLorean was all in. What DeLorean didn't know was that his buddy Hoffman was a fucking narc. He was an informant for the FBI and the feds were ready to go hunting for drug dealers. Did any Has anyone kicked Hoffman's ass? No, he's probably like protected. James Timothy Hoffman? F*** you, dude. I'm pretty sure we, in the DeLorean series, you had the, the same sentiment. Yeah, what a narc ass. What a little punk ass narc after some behind the scenes sneaky moves hoffman put delorean on a plane to los angeles and when he got off undercover agents handed him cocaine uh to go to a surprise party in a nearby hotel where the fbi was waiting john delorean fell for one of the most 80s tricks in the book he thought he could solve all his problems with hundreds of pounds of cocaine but his friend was a narc ass punk and yeah he got and also if like the fbi is giving you the drugs dude. yeah that's entrapment man like yeah. come on well, that's why he I think got we, off. I think we covered this in the DeLorean series as well, yeah. but like, what the hell? Yeah. By the time Back to the Future made the DeLorean a household name, the company was already dead and gone. A Texas businessman named Stephen Wynn got the rights and the remaining inventory and started Frankensteining DeLoreans out of the leftovers for Back to the Future fanboys throughout the 90s. And as you probably are aware, uh, you could still get a lot of um, new OEM stock. New dead stock. New new stock from DeLorean. Uh, if you have a DeLorean and you want to restore it, you can probably get all the parts brand new from from this remaining company. It's a real shame that the car is not any good. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That like, the it, solid it, or the the gold plated one that we saw at the Peterson was really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I think it's a cool car, but it's like not very good. I think an electric DeLorean would be really sick if they brought that shape back mm -hmm. for electric power. That that'd be awesome. Uh, I forget his name, but one of the guys from Hyperdrive who had the charger with the wing. Yes. Um, he's building a drift DeLorean That's right now. That's super oh, cool. cool. With like a tube chassis and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think his name is Alexander Caldine or something like that. I'm looking forward to seeing that thing rip. Yeah. I think that the DeLorean, I think it's uh, it's it's coming. It's coming back. I think it's coming back. I think it's our, it's been back already. Like people who grew up with that in the 80s are finally getting money getting their like kit car DeLoreans made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like the, like back to the future, like kind of ruined the DeLorean for me. At I think least. it's, it saved it. it. It saved it and like made it popular again. Like it did its job, but like if you have a DeLorean, you're it's like, a, it's like saying like, I love back to the future. Yeah. It's like hard to, and it's sorry if they're, you're listening and you're a back to the future <laughs> guy, but they're kind of dorky. <laughs> yeah. And, I get a lot of messages on Instagram that are like, you got to do this. You got to do a show on the DeLorean. And it's like, dude, I don't have to. <laughs> don't. <laughs> like, it's not, it's, it's cool. It's not a great car. No, I not actually a love, car I love Back to the Future. I'm a huge BTTF fan. Oh, yeah. If you're such a <laughs> Back to the Future fan, name every actor in Back to the Future. Uh, Biff, Marty, Doctor. <laughs> The doctor, uh, <laughs> the good doctor, the mom, the nerd dad, the guy. All right, name name the original Marty before they start doing reshoots. Uh, Wasn't it Emilio Estevez? No, it was the redhead dude, Eric. Eric Stoltz. Yeah, Eric, Eric Stoltz. It was yeah. Eric Stoltz. Yeah. The 1980s may not have been the era of supercars we wanted, but it was the era of supercars we needed. There was a gap between the smoke chugging 1970s muscle cars and lightning fast 90s works of art, and the cars that bridged it deserve to be celebrated. 
You can't jump from a 1969 El Camino to the McLaren F1 without building something amazing in between. And it's so crazy that the same company made that those both those cars. How cool would it be if McLaren did do a version of the El Camino at some oh my point? God. Like, they, like they did with the, what was it, the, the GNX. They were involved yeah. with that, right? Uh, the El Makino. Um, you take you take like a one of those like seven sixty five long tails and you make the back a bed. Yeah, <laughs> how sick would that be? Yeah, well, it's a McLaren, so the bed is in the front. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a frunk bed. Yeah, power frunk. <laughs> the eighties was an era of taking big swings and figuring out the nitty gritty later. Just like Enzo Ferrari took a chance on the GTO Evolution team working on after school hours to build the F40. Reeves Calloway took a chance stuffing some spinny boys into a C4 Corvette. And John DeLorean took a chance. He wasn't carting around a small child's weight worth of cocaine because it made him feel good. No, well, it was a maybe, grown man's weight in cocaine. No, he only did he 24 doing... pounds. Oh. That's what he got caught with. But it was all about saving his business. It was all about the spirit of saving DeLorean. DeLorean may not have saved his company, but he was acquitted because the FBI blew the case. Whew. Uh, his car also became one of the most iconic cars in cinema, right up there with Herbie the Love Bug and Bandit's Trans Am. People may not know DeLorean was a failed drug mule and, you know, fading businessman, but they sure as hell know his car. And that's what the 80s was all about, taking a big chance for a big payoff. Without the 80s, we'd never be watching YouTube videos about the upcoming pack of 300 mile per hour daily drivers. Without the 80s, we wouldn't be looking at all-wheel drive electric Porsches that slam you into the back of your seat. I do love that Taycan. Mm -mm -mm. It all started with the big shoulder pads, the wild hair, and out-of-control ambitions. Right now, we're experiencing a new golden age of cars. Supercars are insane. Regular cars are insane. But that wouldn't be possible without the 80s yeah there's like a there's like a modified trx truck by uh hennessy that does like a 3.2 zero to 60 <laughs> yeah. a truck yeah, yeah, a truck. Five thousand pounds but still like yeah things are just so insane now <sighs> what a time what a time huh what a time to be a guy <laughs> well thank you so much for listening to this episode of pass gas it's a good time as always big thanks to our producer yeah. thomas willette and our other producer and editor could do it without her bridget davies yeah. davies follow my my mans on instagram at joe g weber and james pumphrey follow these follow these men wherever you find them, wherever you encounter them on social media. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Write us an email, passgas at donutmedia.com. Uh, just tell us how we're doing. All right. Well, thank you for listening. You're beautiful. Have a good good day. <laughs> <laughs> thank I you. you. And as always, keep it juiced.